Hi, hello everyone. So I am Nikunj Goel, member of technical staff at Adobe, where I work to bring the generative AI to all the Adobe products. Hello everyone, I am Aditi Gupta. I am a software developer engineer at Disney Plus Hotstar, where I work to enhance the consumer experience for the application. Let's quickly gloss over the presentation outline. So starting with the role of GPUs, so starting with the role of GPUs, for computation intensive tasks, we will first cover the concurrent landscape and challenges of GPU scheduling in Kubernetes and propose a RL-based solution designed to address these limitations, offering improvements in efficiency, workload prioritization, and scalability. In recent years, as more and more large-scale ML models are being deployed, GPUs have gained prominence to handle the increasing computational demands of deep learning workloads. With the increase in search workloads, public clouds have provisioned GPU resources at the scale of thousands of nodes in data centers. However, GPUs are relatively new to the cloud stack. Support for efficient GPU management lacks as state-of-the-art cluster resource orchestration treat GPUs only as a specific resource constraint while ignoring its unique characteristics and application properties. So now, with the help of some modern day applications, let's see why efficient GPU scheduling is needed for data intensive ML models. In applications like the self-driving cars, CNNs are trained on millions of labeled images to recognize objects. Efficient GPU scheduling ensures that these large data sets are processed swiftly, enabling faster model training. Next, in the e-commerce recommendation systems, multiple machine learning tasks may run simultaneously, each needing access to a GPU resource. Effective scheduling helps manage these concurrent workloads, preventing resource contention. Then, in the natural language processing, that is, the NLP for chatbots, like OpenAI's GPT models, these often run multiple queries concurrently. Efficient GPU scheduling maximizes the utilization of available GPUs, allowing for numerous user interaction to be processed at once, which is very crucial for responsive customer service. However, as we will see later, that the support for efficient GPU management is very limited and GPUs are mostly treated as a specific resource constraint while ignoring its unique characteristics and application properties. In any computing system, scheduling refers to the way resources are allocated to different tasks. GPU scheduling is the process of allocating this GPU resource to applications or workloads that need it. Let's skim over and outline that how this scheduling works. First is the resource request. So when a workload like a machine learning training job is submitted, it specifies that how many GPUs resources it needs. This is done by the application requesting a certain number of GPUs. Second is the scheduling decision. The scheduler, like the Kubernetes native cube scheduler, looks at the available GPUs across the system and then determines where the workload should be placed based on availability, priority, and resource needs. Job placement is third. So once a decision is made, the job is assigned to the node. Node means a server in the cluster that has the requested GPUs, and then the application starts using those resources. The last is the monitoring and scaling. The scheduler continuously monitors GPU usage. If more resources are needed, or if the workload can scale down, it adjusts accordingly. So to understand how we lack in efficient GPU scheduling, let's dive deep in the default Kubernetes scheduler, that is the cube scheduler. Well, the entry point is API server, which our scheduler watches for any ports that lack a node name field, which means that the port isn't yet scheduled. So, but it uses a very generalized scheduling policy that got no specialized handling for GPUs or any other task specific preference. However, the cube scheduler allows for custom scheduling through both plugins and scheduler framework, which are able to enhance its scheduler capabilities. So here we are demonstrating a 
basic architecture of how Cube Scheduler works. So in center, you got this API server, which listens to all the incoming nodes, and uh, then the scheduler connects to this API server and decides which ports go to which node. So let's come into the detail of current scheduling policy. The algorithm basically got two main phases, the filtering phase and then the scoring phase. So in the first filtering phase, it filters out all the nodes unsuitable for the pod based on pod affinity, tents, and toleration. Like it evaluates if the pod's affinity or anti-affinity rules, that is preference or restriction to be scheduled on certain nodes matches the nodes labels. It also filter out nodes where tents don't align with the pod's toleration. After it got a list of feasible nodes, they are then assigned a normalized score, which is on a scale of 1 to 100, based on the load balancing, node affinity, or any other user-specified criteria. It favors nodes that have the least resource consumption to spread ports evenly. While in certain scenarios, clustering more ports on fewer nodes may be preferred to conserve resources. Uh, this can be seen in scenarios such as auto-scaling or burst scenarios. In this manner, it selects the node with highest score, communicates this decision to the API server, where it binds the port to the chosen node. However, if selected node become unsuitable due to any reason during the binding phase, a secondary node may be chosen. But if you are in a very bad luck and no suitable node is found, port is requeued for further scheduling attempts. So let's hop on to some of the major drawbacks of Cube Scheduler in context of GPUs. First and the foremost is the resource fragmentation. Cube Scheduler does not natively support the fine-grained GPU resource sharing. It treats GPUs as integer units, meaning a pod is either assigned a whole GPU or none, leading to the inefficient utilization if a workload does not fully use the GPU's power. This leads to inefficient resource utilization where some workloads may underutilize the GPU while others are left waiting. Also, this inability to handle the partial GPU allocations lead to fragmentation. That means the jobs that need fewer resources still consume entire GPU, making the cluster very inefficient. This inefficient use of available GPUs makes small jobs block GPUs with unused capacity. Second is the heterogeneous hardware management. The Cube scheduler doesn't have built-in features to manage different types of GPUs, that is the NVIDIA and the AMD, just for an example. Custom configurations or vendor-specific plugins like the NVIDIA device plugin are required to manage this heterogeneity, but they do not integrate seamlessly with the Cube scheduler. Then we have the lack of preemptive scheduling. So yes, you heard it right. The Cube Scheduler does not even support the preemptive scheduling for GPU resources, meaning high priority jobs can't preempt the lower priority ones. They work as a monopoly, causing delays for critical tasks if long running jobs are occupying the GPUs, hence resulting in higher job latency for the critical tasks. The Cube Scheduler also does not natively have a strong awareness of the real-time status or health of GPU resources. It relies on static information like resource requests and limits when making scheduling decision. This leads to potential delays or job failures if the GPU availability changes dynamically. Let's see how the reinforcement learning could be a prominent solution for the multifaceted problems in GPU utilization. Reinforcement learning, that is RL, is one of the three flavors of machine learning. But unlike supervised or unsupervised learning, where the model learns from labeled or unlabeled data respectively, the RL has an agent that interacts with an environment. Then it takes actions and get feedback. Feedback means the rewards. These feedbacks are based on how good or bad those actions are. By constantly learning from this feedback and reward cycle, the agent eventually figures out how to make the best decisions to maximize its rewards. Yep. So why we think RL is a good option for scheduling these GPUs. 
So first, RL can do multiple objective optimization. It can consider optimization of diverse metrics like GPU utilization, task latency, and power efficiency, all of these simultaneously. It can also manage large state space like GPU utilization, queue length, job types, all of them together quite well. It further inherently supports feedback loops, thus improving the scheduling policy as it gains more experience. Lastly, you have got an autonomous decision-making machine. So it minimizes the need for constant manual tuning and configuration updates. So we can't use RL just as a plug and play. To use RL, you need to first model the GPU scheduling problem as a Markov decision process. So in a Markov decision process, you got three things. First, a state, a action, and a reward. So in our case, the state is just a one-dimensional vector with normalized node and pod features. So what would be a state? It's just a vector with entries such as node 1, node 2, node 3, 4, up to node n, and then the pod. Next, uh, the scheduler plays the role of agent here, uh, whose actions are to select a node for the given pod to be executed. And thus, the action space is all the possible nodes in the cluster. Finally, the reward function of DRS reflects the average resource utilization across your cluster, which is a custom function that takes into account the different utilization metrics and it can easily be customized to reflect some of the particular situations. So, based on this, we propose a deep reinforcement based scheduler, which we name as DRS scheduler. This DRS scheduler has got three main components. First, you got the monitors, which run on each of the node that has got a GPU. And on each node, this monitor collects your real time GPU usage matrix and then passes them on to the decision maker. The decision maker is our RL agent. It receives the metrics from the monitors, make the scheduling decision based on its inner neural networks, and passes them on to the Kubernetes scheduler, the cube scheduler that we discussed earlier. This cube scheduler then actually uses the RL agent's decision to schedule the ports on the nodes. And across all this, you got a feedback loop that provides feedback from actual scheduling outcomes back to the RL agent, allowing it to improve over the time. So coming to the main crux of our whole model, the decision maker. So what is the decision maker? It's just a deep Q network model that leverages Markov decision process to accurately represent the behavior of our scheduling agent. Uh, this DRS decision maker communicate with the native cube scheduler and DRS monitor which are situated on each of the worker nodes through socket based channel. The socket based channels are used so that uh, it enables the decision maker to collect and respond to real time data. Uh, then it got this experience pool which is filled with scheduling data as a new, new scheduling events keep on occurring. Once this pool reaches its capacity, which is a predetermined uh, constant, it is leveraged for training the neural network. The decision-making process itself is centered around calculating Q values based on your normalized cluster state vector. These Q values guide the selection of actions, prioritizing those that promise the highest reward, giving the current state of cluster. After reaching 50 scheduling iterations, the weight of target networks are synchronized with that of evaluation network to stabilize the training process. So how we train this decision maker? So to train this decision maker effectively, we begin by random initialization, which happens in all of the machine learning algorithms. In this context, the initialization involves setting up an experience pool with a capacity of 300 entries, as well as defining the queue function through a neural network with weight initialized to random values. So both of the neural networks got their random weight initialization. The first phase of the training algorithm focus on handling real time scheduling request from the Kubernetes scheduler. Like for each scheduling request, the model captures the current cluster state 
compute Q values for the, all the possible actions. These Q values represent the potential reward or benefit for each action in relation to the given state. Once the Q values are calculated, an epsilon greedy algorithm is applied to select the next action. What this algo does? With a probability epsilon, this algo will choose the action with the highest Q value and then send it to the experience store. Now, if the experience store is full, the model will initiate training by randomly sampling experiences from the pool. This sample serves as training data for the neural network, enabling it to learn from the past scheduling decisions and refine its Q value predictions. However, if the pool is not yet at capacity, the model simply continues to add new experiences without initiate the training. So next we got the second part of our model, that is the DRS monitors. So this DRS monitor is responsible for deploying monitoring agents across each node that has got GPUs. These monitoring agents are implemented as daemon sets, ensuring that a dedicated monitoring is available on each of the GPU enabled node. The DRS agents utilize NVIDIA's Data Center GPU Manager, DCGM, to facilitate GPU telemetry collection and monitor GPU health. Among the key metrics collected, so the metrics are shown on the bottom left of the screen. So uh, among the key metrics are device memory activity, which measures memory load and bandwidth usage on the GPU. GPU temperature, which is another critical indicator of hardware health and cooling efficiency. Then you got the graphic engine activity, which reflect the utilization of the GPU's graphical processing resources and buffer memory uses among others, which helps gauge memory demand and availability. So once collected, these GPU metrics are stored in a time series database, such as Prometheus which is well suited for managing and querying historical data in Kubernetes environments. So let's put it all together and come to how we train and serve our model. So as you discussed earlier, the collected historical data in Prometheus is used to create a simulated environment. So we train our agent with synthetic workload that includes that historical data plus some augmented data. And this is trained in this simulated environment before deploying it in the production. So a hybrid approach is followed that is offline for initial training and online for fine tuning. And this works quite well. So how decision making workflow works here? So we implement the trained model in a lightweight inference server. For example, we can take TensorFlow serving to reduce latency. Next you integrate the RL model as an external scheduler plugin to the Kubernetes scheduler. So what happens at each scheduling event, the external scheduler would call the RL agent, passing the current state and in return, receiving a scheduling decision as action. So in what ways using this RL based GPU scheduler could help? So we have identified four major areas where this RL based scheduler could help. First, it will help balance load and to avoid overload by distributing workloads evenly across all the GPUs in your cluster. Next, the RL scheduler can provide support for mixed workloads as it can easily learn to handle diverse workload types. Further, it can minimize wait times and allocate job faster, resulting in reduced job completion time. Finally, the RL policy can also incorporate energy consumption metrics, which result in energy efficiency and in result the cost savings. Now, let's explore that how the RL based solution that we proposed can enhance some key CNCF projects. First, we go on Argo. Argo manages workflows with DAGs. RL will help dynamical task prioritization and hence boost throughput and scalability. 
Kubeflow uses Kubernetes native scheduling, but RL can enhance job scheduling, hence reducing the training times and improve the pipeline efficiency. Native uses demand-based auto-scaling, but RL will implement the predictive auto-scaling that will lead to the better performance and more responsive auto-scaling in native. Now, let's dive deep that how RL-based scheduler can be integrated with Kubeflow and enhance its overall performance. Kubeflow pipelines often face GPU bottlenecks when running concurrent ML workloads. RL-driven DRS scheduler address GPU assignments based on real-time loads, hence providing faster execution of GPU-intensive tasks, reducing overall workflow completion time. As you know, KF serving is a key component of Kubeflow that is designed to handle end-to-end -end flow of inference requests for machine learning models in the production environment. In inference services, the demand for GPU resources can vary widely. This is based on type of the user request with some requests requiring very much power and some requiring very less. This is all due to the difference in the nature of the complexity of these requests. To address this, RL-based scheduling dynamically allocates GPU resources based on real-time demand, ensuring that each service gets the appropriate resource. During peak times, the system predicts workload patterns prioritizes critical requests and minimizes resource contention. This reduces the latency. Additionally, the RL scheduler informs auto-scaling decisions, optimizing GPU resource distribution across replicas to handle the traffic fluctuations efficiently. By continuously learning from performance metrics, the RL model improves resource utilization, reduces idle GPU time prevents over-provisioning and ultimately lowering the cost while ensuring faster response times for these real-time applications. Finally, we have the cut-up. In Kubeflow, the model training also includes hyperparameter tuning of jobs, and this generally generates multiple experiments that can overwhelm the GPU resources if not scheduled efficiently. The DRS scheduler learns to allocate GPU resources based on the computational needs of each CATEB experiment. Hence, the Kubeflow benefits by receiving reduced idle GPU time and faster exploration of hyperparameters. This all leads to a quicker convergence in the model optimization. Hence, we see that RL can be a big game changer in the landscape of GPU scheduling for both the Kube scheduler and other projects. And hence, we are up for the Q&A. Thank you, folks. Any questions, please? Hey, thank you for the talk. Um, I just had one question. Um, something I've really run into when messing around with custom schedulers on a shared use cluster is that uh, users can get quite interested in why their jobs didn't get scheduled or did get scheduled, um, you know, when it's the thing stopping them from being able to run their experiment and train a new model. They can be yeah, quite interested in exactly why a scheduling decision was made. Um, do you think that using like kind of black box methods like reinforcement learning would like impact that? Do you think that would be a problem or is that not something that you guys think that would be, you know, not an issue you think would be run into? So basically, uh, so as you discussed, so that what this RL can do in your scenario is you can tune that specific reward function. So reward function is a totally customizable function. So if I need to tune down parameter one, tune up the parameter 10, so you just code out the relevant reward function and it will act accordingly. So it's just like you put out your own reward function and then do your job. Thank you. Hi, a uh, quick question. Um, so how do you distinguish between a short, uh, um, sh short term running jobs and long term up, uh, upfront if, um, so 
in your presentation, you said that long uh, long running jobs could um, uh, create kind of starvation scenarios for short uh, short running jobs. So how do you distinguish that? So it's not about uh, differentiating between the short term jobs and the long term jobs. So uh, like you consider two different scenarios in which uh, the scenario one, the long term job, it just hangs out the system for and all the other jobs are exhausted. So none of them gets to schedule on a GP. And in scenario two, you got a critical long term job, which is pending since other short term jobs are getting scheduled continuously. So in this, like it's a loss loss situation. So what Ariel can do in this scenario is like you calculate the loss one, so one is minus 10 and another is minus 100. So you got to choose which is less harmful for you. So if like, if you are okay with a long term but critical job hanging out all other jobs that is okay so we like we don't distinguish between the short term jobs and long term jobs it ultimately like scheduling which one of them results in more benefit for entire scheduling activity yeah just to add on like it's uh, about the complete system performance it's not like we will prioritize on the longer jobs or the shorter jobs rl will adjust itself accordingly and automatically and it will create a balance for the efficiency of the complete system and not deprioritizing any one of them. Uh, like, I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Aditi and Nikunj. Um, I had a question based on what was asked before, uh, deterministic and non-deterministic scheduling. So um, I think one of the colleagues highlighted this would be non-deterministic. Yep. It's, uh, reinforcement based learning. So do you have any benchmarking uh, to support that this will be beneficial? So currently we haven't, uh, so I haven't come across any of the metrics which uh, takes in account into non deterministic scheduling. So I guess that is an open event. Okay, thank you. And one more question. Uh, I think there's been this theme of DRA, I think, which also yep. targets a similar solution. So um, are you guys also planning to do a benchmarking against that once that gets GA? Because that would be a solution which targets towards GPU optimization, as in scheduling optimization and usage optim optimization. Yeah, I guess we can target on that. So okay. I'm not aware of the details about that. Sure. But I guess we can go offline if need to discuss further. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.